DJ. Yeah. How about now? Okay, there we go. All right. Well, this morning we're going to be wrapping up the book of James. So we've been trucking through all month. Uh, but before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and how it's alive and active, um, even today and forever, Lord. I pray that you would just get me out of the way, and Lord, that your spirit would um, speak to our hearts, or the things that you need us to hear, and Lord, the things that um, I shouldn't say, Lord, that you would hold my tongue and help me to just speak your word boldly this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> All right, so we're going to be in James chapter 5, um, verses 1 through 20. Basically, we're going through the last chapter. <coughs> so James was the half-brother of Jesus Christ. He didn't believe that Jesus was Christ until after the resurrection. And <coughs> really, a lot of the book of James parallels Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. So it's obvious that even though faith, not faith, didn't, even though James didn't believe Jesus was God, he was still paying attention during that time. So when Jesus was out preaching and telling the message, James was still paying attention, be like, oh, well, okay, yeah, right. And then suddenly Christ rises again. He's like, oh, all this is true. So I'm going to go share it with everyone. And he includes it in his letter here to the dispersed church. Um, from Jerusalem. And he wrote this letter to the church to encourage them to keep going in their faith and to not settle for the status quo and the getting comfortable in their faith and their situation that they're currently in. So far we've looked at faith in the midst of trials and how that should produce joy in our life even though there are hard and difficult times. We know that Christ is with us during that. Um, during these trials, faith should drive us back to God to seek Him in prayer. We've also seen that faith should show that we belong to God. We've looked at how faith is demonstrated and shown in the way that we serve and how when we serve the most needy and the most vulnerable people, that's showing our faith in action. And that's showing that we're not being partial or showing favoritism towards someone else. It's well, this message is for everyone. So shown in how we serve and in our actions. It's shown in how we apply the word to our life. And it's also <coughs> reflected in how we speak and the wisdom that we share, how we live our lives, shouts out our faith. And it's revealed in how we talk to God and in our daily conversations with other people. So finally, in James chapter 5, James starts, and he's like, okay, well, now we're going to talk about our conduct. How are we acting out, living out our daily lives? How does faith apply to that? So we get to James chapter 5, starting in verse 1. It says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of your labor who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you and the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it, until it gets the early and the late rains. You, too, be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take 
take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. But your yes is to be yes, and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. If anyone cheerful, he is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they will pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered up in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins one to another, and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He, pour, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth, and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So in the beginning of chapter 5, it's faith is revealed in how we use our possessions. The things that we have reveals where our heart is, our treasure. Scripture says that where your heart is, there is a treasure also. So what are you doing with your possessions? <clears throat> and James begins with a warning saying, judgment is coming. But this judgment isn't based on whether you're rich or poor. <clears throat> But rather, what are you doing with the things that you have? God has blessed you with all these things in your life. How are you using them? We personally don't know the heart of people. We can speculate, but we really don't know the heart. But we can see the fruit from people's actions. The words that they speak. And James is going, writing to these Christians saying, hey, you've lied to your hired help. You've stolen things that were rightfully belonged to other people. And then you condemned and murdered God's people. <coughs> and verse 6 says, you have condemned and put to death a righteous man, and he doesn't even resist you. In Scripture, the righteous man re refers to God's people. They aren't righteous in and of, in of themselves, but those, those the righteous people are the people that have put their trust in God and have accepted His gift of salvation. In Matthew 5, 21 and 22, Christ warns that anger and really belittlement towards other people is held to the same standard as murder says, if you have heard, you have heard that the agents were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable in the court. But I say to you, this is Jesus talking, that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court, and whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court, and whoever says you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. So these Christians may not have physically been murdering their brothers and their helpers, but in their hearts they were. So he's telling them, hey, your actions are, and how you're using your resources are testifying against you in this. You aren't even living out the faith that God has called you to live out. You've been showing favoritism and only giving to the people that you really want to. And you're really, your favorite person is yourself. Last week we talked about selfish ambition and how everything is about you. If it benefits you in some way, then, well, yeah, I'm going to do it. It's going to make me look good. I'm going to have everything that I want. <clears throat> 
But these Christians that are scattered out are getting so comfortable and they're wanting to build their own kingdoms that they're withholding what rightfully belongs to other people. This man hired people to take care of his fields. They went out and mowed it. They came up to him and he's, no, I'm not, I'm not going to pay you. I can use this money for something else. They're living by the world's wisdom, which says, hey, get rich. Save up everything you can. Hoard it so you can have all these great things rather than trusting the, the word's wisdom, capital W, God's wisdom. Um, in Mark chapter 10, you see the rich young ruler coming up to Christ. He says, well, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus tells him, well, this is the law. And this young man said, well, I've been keeping these since I was a child or from my youth. And Jesus tells him, well, there's one thing that you lack. Sell all that you have and you will have riches in heaven. Then come and follow me. The scripture says that, that this man went away sad because he owned much property. He put his identity in what he had. He was worshiping the things that he had over Christ and salvation. He was not willing to give up those things. So he went away sad. He was chasing his own selfish ambition. That's exactly what James is telling these scattered Christians. Hey, stop doing this. Don't chase this thing. Instead, turn to God. Repent from these things. In verse 2 of chapter 5, it says, Your riches have rotted, and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you, and will consume your flesh like fire. So the very possessions that you have are rotting away. You're storing all these things. You're building up these stockpiles of all these material possessions, and they're literally just sitting there and rotting away. All of your gold and your silver, all these precious things that you think are incredible, Incredible, they're just falling apart. You may think you have all these great things, but what are they going to be in 10 years, in 20 years? What are they going to be in 100 years? Where will you be in 100 years? <clears throat> so what good are these things? All these things will eventually be broken, or they'll be sold or given away to someone. When you pass on, you're not taking these things with you. They're going to stay here. Eventually, they're going to become someone else's. These precious things. James 4 says that our life is just a vapor. We're here for a moment and then gone. But all of our possessions are going to leave, be, still be here or destroyed. Eventually destroyed in the very end. So what good is it to store up all these things? In the book of Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, not Song of Solomon, Solomon, <laughs> he looks around and is like, hey, all these great things that I built up in this great kingdom that I've built, and I've, all these wonderful things, I've built them essentially for other people to have. He'll enjoy them for a very short amount of time, but he realizes that this is all going to be, all going to go to someone else. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't invest and save for the future or save for your future offspring or whichever. But he, the thing is to do it wisely. All of these things are God's anyway. They are gifts to you. Yes, you worked for it or you inherited it, but everything is ultimately God's. What are you doing with it? It's kind of like the gift of the talents. The master was going off on a long trip and he gave each of his servants so many talents. And the first one who had 10, he invested it. He's like, okay, well, I'm going to invest this here. I know it's the king's, but I'm going to invest it and get the most out of it that I can. 
One that got five talents, he did the same thing. And each one of those people, they doubled the amount of talents that the master left them with. And then there's the man who received one, and he buried it, covered it up in the dirt. Say, well, you aren't doing anything for this, so I'm just going to let it sit in the dirt. When you come back, I'll give it to you. You'll have the exact same thing that you left me with. So the master returns, and each servant goes back, goes up to him and says, hey, you gave me this much, this is what I have for you now. This is yours. And each time, the master's like, well, good servant, good and faithful servant. And the one who didn't do anything with what God gave him and just hid it away and stockpiled it, he rebuked, and he gave that talent to someone else. So what are we doing with our resources? What are we doing with the things that God has blessed us with? In Matthew 6, it says, Don't store up your treasures here on earth, but to store them in heaven. Are you building your kingdom? Are you building his kingdom? How we use our possessions shows where our faith is. It shows that we trust God that there is treasure in heaven. And newsflash, it's not going to be a super nice bed. It's not going to, we're not, yes, he's building in mansions for us, but that's not the treasure that he has for us. Yes, if you're faithful, you're going to have crowns, a crown of life, but guess what? We're going to throw those right back at Christ, Christ's feet. Those treasures in heaven are other believers. The fruit that we have in the minutes, the things, when we go out and we're faithful, we're telling other people about Christ, we are storing treasures in heaven. When we're faithful and the word goes out, Scripture says the word never goes out void. And as we're telling people about God, the things that he has done for us, um, in men's study yesterday, we tell us exactly what we talked about, is what are you doing in your conversations? Are you looking for opportunities to share what God has done in your life? Your story is powerful. When you share it, God uses it. Because your story in Christ points directly to him. So whatever we, however we use our possessions should also point back to Christ. So faith is revealed in how we use our possessions. The next, faith is revealed through patience and endurance. Um, in verse 7 through 12, it says this, says, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and the late rains. You, too, be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your less yes be yes and your no, no, so that you will not fall under judgment. This therefore refers to where our focus should be. Our focus is not building our own kingdom, but it's building God's kingdom. In the beginning of James, is talking about the rich man stocking up all of his wealth and withholding it from those who have worked for it. And here it's like, okay, well, you, this man, you are building your own kingdom. You need to stop that and work on God's kingdom. That is what we have been called to do. Those are Christ's final words before he ascended up into heaven. Is hey, go out and tell all nations about me. Disciple them. He didn't say, okay, I'm leaving. Make yourself a nice castle here and live in it until I come back. <clears throat> And he is coming back. 
We don't know when, but we know that he is. Matthew 24 talks about we don't know the time, the day, or the hour. We don't know these things. All we know is that he is, and we can have hope in that. That doesn't mean that you sit and wait until he returns. It's like, okay, well, he can come any time now. So I'm just going to sit here in my easy chair and just wait until he appears and I'll go up and be with him. It's we have a job to do. Until he returns, our job is to tell others about the things that he has done. First and foremost is that he paid for our sins so we can spend eternity with him and be in a right relationship with him. And we have faith that he is coming again. In verses 7 and 8, James gives the example of a farmer. How the farmer waits patiently for his produce. How many have planted something this summer, this year? A lot of us have. You didn't plant it one day and then the next afternoon go, okay, well, I'm going to harvest what I planted yesterday because it's going to be great. I planted all these rows. Everything's going to be wonderful. You didn't do that. It would be a waste of resources. It's, it takes time for those things to grow. And you didn't even do it the next week or the next month. You waited all summer long and into the fall before you're like, okay, well, I have this great harvest that I get to go out and reap the, the produce of. And James is like the same way as the seeds that we plant spiritually. When you go out and you are living the faith that God has called you to live, it's not overnight that those seeds grow and sprout into fruit. When you do see that happen, it's not because of the one cult of, cult of a cat. <laughs> <laughs> Lack of a word. <laughs> it's not because of that one time that you poured into that soil and into that seed. It's because of someone else who had planted that seed long ago and you were reaping the benefits of the seed being watered and cultivated year after year after year until finally you pour into this and it's ready to harvest the next day. It doesn't happen overnight. And when you pour into other people's lives like that and you're planting these seeds and you're just faithful to do the next thing that God has in front of you, you're building God's kingdom. You're not building your own kingdom. James further goes into the example of the prophets in verses 9 through 11. It says, We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. So these Christians were familiar with the story of Job. They had heard about he was a righteous man and he did what was pleasing in the sight of the Lord. Yet, Satan came in. He had to get permission from God to do anything to him. That's something we have to keep in mind. Whenever anything happens against us, it's not without God's permission. So God is like, okay, well, Satan, have you considered Job? And Job comes down, and if you're familiar with the story, all these terrible things happened to him and his family and his land, and he lost everything so much that he, he wanted to die. And he had his debate with God, his day in court, and um, he defended himself. And I was like, well, where were you in the beginning? And Job couldn't, didn't have anything to say after that. He was like, okay, well, you are God. You, you're sovereign over everything. And in the end, because of Job's faith and his endurance through all these hard trials and times, God blessed him far more than he was before. And these Christians were familiar with that story. They knew, well, I know, I know Job. Well, I know the story of Job and what happened to him. I know the outcome of it. And how God was merciful with him. And blessed him because of his faith. And just like in the beginning of James, count all joy when you face trials of many kinds. 
is because God is perfecting you in those times. If you think back when you went to school last, and you're thinking, okay, we went through all these classes and we were learning all these things, and then there's a test. Okay, well, why am I having a test? Because you learned all these things. Now we're seeing if you actually learned it and you know it. The same way God is constantly pouring into us and okay, well, th this is going to be helpful for the kingdom later down the road. Learn this. Learn this. Here's the test. And if you don't pass the test, it comes right back again and again and again and again. And then later in life, if you've learned from these trials, the same similar trial comes up. It's like, oh, I've seen this before. God has rescued me out of it before. I can take joy because I know that he's with me and he's still perfecting my faith. Then James gets to, to verse 12. He says, but above all brethren... So uh, above and more than being patient, more than enduring, get this. So do not swear either by heaven or by earth with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you will not fall under the judgment. This isn't a hard concept. If you tell someone yes, it means yes. If, I'm, if you're going to tell God, yes, I'm going to live for you, you better be living for him. If you tell one of your brothers or your sisters or anyone, yes, I'm going to go do this, follow through with it. In the same way, if you say no, then that means no. We have three kids in our house, and... <clears throat> Sometimes we wonder, well, do they, uh, do they know what no means and they, do they, they know what yes means? For sure. Uh, you tell them no and they'll test the boundaries. Like, well, do they really mean no or is it just, yes, I'm going to go do it anyway. And just like with our kids, there's consequences for those things. There's consequences when we don't follow through with our word with God and with other people. And it's not enjoyable. <clears throat> so let your yes be yes and your no be no. In chapter 4, verses 13 and 17, we don't even know what we're going to be doing the next day. It says, and Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and, do, and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, and such boasting is evil. Therefore, to the one who knows to do the right thing and does not do it, to him it is sin. So in the same way we're talking about these things, yes, I'm going to go do this. Do you really know that you're going to do that? We aren't promised tomorrow. <clears throat> but when we talk about things that we're going to do in the future, or yes, I'm going to do this, you should do it with the heart of, if God wants me to do this, if it's God's will for us to go this, this way or that way or to do this thing, it'll happen. I'm still going to make plans to do whatever this thing is that we're intending to do, knowing that God's going to direct those steps. In Proverbs 16.9, it says that man plans his way, but God, or the Lord, directs his steps. So just like with... <clears throat> Um, our possessions and the things that we have, yes, use them wisely, invest, save for these things because life happens. In the same way, you know, plan and be like, okay, Lord, these are my plans. What do you want? Where do you want us to go with it? And just keep moving forward. And God will say, okay, well, turn this way, go this way. Help, you're going to stay here for a while and then you're get to where you're going. On the same token of yeah, making your yes be yes, 
We read about the rich man who withheld the pay of his laborers. Or to put it in our context, context, he had a ranch. He had all these ranch hands that came in. They took care of his fields. They're immaculate. He's like, yes, I'm going to pay you. The job is done. He's like, no, I'm going to keep that for myself. I know I said I'd pay you so much amount, but it's, it's really nice <clears throat> to have that kind of money on hand. So I'm just not going to pay you. Um, he did not follow through with what he promised. He was going to pay his laborers and his help. So as a result, his integrity was pulled into question, like, well, are you really the man that you say you are? You lied to us. You stole from us. Just like James says, the pay which you withheld from your laborers is testifying against you. So if you say you're going to do something, do it. And faithfully enduring and patiently waiting shows that we trust God will come through for us. We're told to lay our treasures up in heaven. We're building his kingdom. But we do that in faith. And that's going to follow through with how we act in whatever situation that we're in. So we've looked at how faith is revealed in using our possessions and how we use our possessions. It's revealed in how we endure in our patience in situations, patience and waiting for what the Lord is going to do next. And lastly, is faith is revealed in pointing others to God. So in verse 13 to the end of the chapter, it says this, Says, is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of a prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly and it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. When he prayed again, the sky poured rain and the earth produced its fruit. <laughs> My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and turns one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So faith is revealed by pointing others to God. And he starts out here with <coughs> some very simple things. Like, hey, are, are any of you suffering? Then you, you, should, you should pray. Bring this before the Lord. If you're cheerful, praise God for it. And if you're sick, have those who are in authority in the church come and gather around you and pray for you and anoint you with oil. If you're caught in sin, if you're in sin, living in sin, pray. Confess your sins to each other and lift it before the Lord. And it's not, it's not easy to do this. It's like, well, yes, it's common. We hear these things. We know that if the hard times come up, we need to pray. We know that when we're cheerful, yeah, we sh should be happy about it. But James explicitly says here, hey, pray if you're suffering, if you're hurting, you're going through hard times, whatever it is, lift it before the Lord. If you're cheerful, if, things, if God has blessed you, praise him for it. Don't just, you know, polish your name badge and go, I got, I got this. I'm so happy. It's, yes, be cheerful about it, but praise God. It is not because of your work alone. God blessed you with it. If you're sick, come to the church. Come to call the leaders to you and have them pray over you. 
And it says that a prayer <coughs> from a righteous man avails much. So when you pray, just like with wisdom, believe that you will receive those things. You ask God for wisdom, well, don't doubt that he'll give it to you. Just pray expectantly. Okay, Lord, I need wisdom in this. Give it to me, please. I need this. And expect to receive it. In the same way, if you constantly pray, Lord, we need this to happen in our lives. This is what's going on. But you're, in your heart, you're like, he's not going to do it. I don't believe that God's actually going to come down and give what I asked for. Then he won't. But if you pray to him, saying, Lord, this is what's going on. This is what's going on in our country right now. Lord, you, we need you to come down, come down and intervene. Lord, this is what's going on in our family right now. You know all the circumstances that are around it. Come and be in this situation. But if you pray that and be expectant that God's going to come down and do something. Because he will get all the glory for it. But to do that, it requires us to discipline and renew our minds. In Romans 12, it says to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That takes conscious effort to renew your mind. So well, what do I renew my mind with? It's with the gospel. If you're telling yourself the gospel, hey, Jesus died on the cross for me and the, my sins and for the sins of the world, his sacrifice is enough to cover whatever situation this is. So how does the fact that Jesus gave his life for us and we are part of his family, how does that apply to the situation? Renew your mind. <clears throat> And then think on things above. Um, throughout James, it says that wisdom comes from above, flowing down from the Father of heavenly lights. Thinking on things above. What pleases the Lord? If you need a more exhaustive list, go to Philippians 4.8. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right and pure and lovely, if it has a good report, Think on those things. Is it excellent? Is it worthy of any praise? Think on these things. And then we should choose to redirect our thoughts. In 2 Corinthians 10, Paul is writing to the Corinthians. He's like, take every thought captive. We have the ability to do that. If a thought comes into your mind, you have the ability to think, oh, well, I'm going to keep thinking about this, or I'm going to throw it out the window and never think about it again. If it pops back in, throw it out another window. <clears throat> Take every thought captive. And James continues with <clears throat> the story of Elijah. It says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. It did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. <clears throat> a lot of times we focus on the, the great and wonderful things that the prophets in the Old Testament did. But they are fallen people just like we are. They had struggles. They had difficulties that are, overwhelmed them. We think of Elijah, we think of him when he prayed for rain, or well, we prayed for rain to stop first, and then he prayed that it would come back, and it came. We think of Elijah when he goes up on Mount Carmel against the prophets of Baal, and he prays, and God shows up through fire on the altar. But you know that Elijah also ran and hid in a cave and wanted to die there because people were chasing him? He thought he was the only one that was still following God. So he's like, I want to give up. I just, want, I just want to be with you. I want to be out of this world. <coughs> and not in a good way. He's one who wanted to die. <laughs> um, but God told him, there are still 7,000 other people who have not bent their knee to Baal and serving me just like you are or were. 
And then he continued to show Elijah signs like, hey, look at this, all pointing back to God. And Elijah got back on his feet and started following the Lord again. But Elijah was a man just like us. He had struggles. He was human. He wasn't a make-believe character. But God still used him with all of his faults. And then he pointed back to God every time. When the rain f stopped, he didn't say, hey, I made the rain stop. And it's up to me for the rain to come back. It's God caused this to happen. And when the rain came back, this is because of God. It's not because of me. It's because God did this. And finally, James says to restore a fallen brother. If a brother is caught in sin, we're to restore them and bring them back. In verse 19, it says, My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So as we're living this faith that God has called us to live in, as we're pursuing Him, we're renewing our minds and being faithful to His calling. <clears throat> if our brother right next to us is falling away, take them by the hand and bring them back. But Paul gives us a warning when we do that in Galatians 6 1 he says brethren if anyone is caught in any trespass or sin you who are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness each one looking to yourself so that you will not be tempted so yes go and restore your brother but you need to be careful that you're not falling to the same temptation that they are if needs be, take someone else with you. Be like, hey, this brother is struggling. They're falling away. We need to come to him and encourage him gently. We're not going to shove him to the ground and stomp on him because he messed up. We're not going to cast him out because he sinned. We sin too. James tells us in earlier that if you stumble on one point, you're guilty of everything when it comes to the law. So if you've lied, it's the same as murdering someone. It's like you've done all of it. So be careful. Yes, restore your brother, but be sure that you don't fall into the same temptation and sin as you're working with them. And if the brother is restored, it says that that is enough to cover a multitude of sins. Not to mention, you have built a great relationship in that. That shows that that brother can trust you. Everyone, you should be, to have a friend, you should be a friend. If you see someone going along the wayside, or... Reverse it. If you, how many of us have been in hard, difficult situations, and you have that one friend that will just drop everything to bring you back? You are to be that person for your brothers and your sisters. If you see them going along in the ditch and in the trenches, go down there and help them, bring them back, but do it with gentleness and do it in love. So faith is revealed in how we point people to God. Our lives are constantly pointing somewhere and to someone. They're either pointing to ourselves or they're pointing to God. And that's reflected in everything that we do. If we're pointing to ourselves, if we give something, we're often looking at, well, I'm going to give as long as it benefits me. You know, if I, if I can give this great amount... You know, can I get a tax credit on that? You know, can I get a plaque that says this was donated by, by me so everyone for all time can see that, hey, I contributed this? That's when we're pointing to ourselves. When you speak and act on something, if you're pointing to yourself, you're thinking, well, does this make me look good? If I go and do this thing, are people going to think, wow, 
Alan, you did, you're great because you helped someone do something. Or if you have to go through a difficult time, if you're pointing to yourself, you're going to suffer very loudly. Whoa, this is so hard. Whoa, I can't believe this happened. Hey, guess what happened to me? This was awful. I can't believe I had to go through this. And you will serve people if you have to, if you're pointing to yourself. On the flip side, if you're pointing to God, just those same areas in your life are going to point straight to God. If you're going to give, you're going to give generously. If you're going to serve and you're going to act on something, you're going to do it in love. And so that you can point back to God. If you're going to suffer through something, you're going to endure it. And you're going to be patient with it. Yes, it won't be comfortable. Yes, it's going to be a difficult time, but you're going to endure it and you're going to have patience. You're going to have that joy that is promised at the beginning of James. And then when it comes to service, you're going to serve sacrificially. You know that the things that you have are the Lord's. The time that you have is the Lord's. So when you serve other people in love, you're going to serve them sacrificially and point them back to the Lord. And really, that's the whole point of James, is our faith <clears throat> in action. So if our faith is aligned with our actions, we'll constantly be pointing other people to Christ, no matter what the circumstances. So... Does our life look like that? Are you living your faith in such a way that when you're going through these trials, you're driven directly to God? And because you know that God is your Father, you can have joy in it, that He is walking with you through every single situation. Again, going back to Christ's last words here on earth, is, hey, lo, I am with you always to the end of the age or to end of time, depending on your translation. So we'll go through these trials and we're still pointing people to Christ. When you serve, it's going to be evident, hey, this person is authentic in their faith. They aren't just reaching out to the people that look like them, that think like them. They're going to the people that are easy to overlook and they're going to serve them. So are you doing that? People that are difficult to go up to and just share God's love with them. Are you just passing by? Just like the man who was on the road who was beaten and robbed. And the priest came up to them and just kind of went by the side. Same a Levite and a Samaritan man. Finally, he came by and had compassion on him and served him. Someone who was easy to overlook. Are we doing that? Faith is also revealed in our words and our how we conduct our lives. Are you depending on the world's wisdom or are you depending on God's wisdom? Are you talking to God? Are you trying to figure everything out on your own? Do you have that relationship with Him? Is your faith reflected in your daily conversations? When you go get together with your friends and family, what are your conversations like? Are they pointing people to yourself? Are you demeaning other people? Or are you pointing them to God? When you, the way that you act, your conduct, how is it? Are you pl pleasing God and giving Him glory in the way that you use your things and your possessions? Or are you squandering it for yourself? Are you pointing others to God? <coughs> Maybe you're thinking, I don't even know God. I don't even know who Jesus is. You've been talking about him this whole time. I don't even really know him. I've heard some things about him. In order to really point someone to God, you have to know him. And to know him through his son, Jesus Christ, and what he did on the cross. The gospel, which is the good news, is for everyone. And it's this, that in the beginning, God created the whole world. He created it perfect. 
He created man, placed him in it, and had an awesome relationship, better than any other man has ever had, besides Christ, with God. But God gave us a choice to either glorify him and walk with him or to disobey and rebel against him. And mankind broke that relationship. And they sinned, we sinned against God. And since that, that relationship was severed, God is like, well, I still love you. Says, and John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So he sent Jesus down. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for our sins. And he rose again, defeating death and sin and hell. He did that. And all Scripture says is that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. You will be back in that relationship with God. You will not be destined for hell anymore. If you have not done that, do not leave this place without doing it first. We're going to have a, we're going to pray. And we're going to have a time of invitation. If there's something that God has laid on your heart, it doesn't have to be anything related to even this, the message this morning. If you know people who are sick, people who don't know him, or if God is dealing with something in your own heart, bring it before him. You can grab a deacon. You can grab a deaconess. They would love to pray with you. I would love to pray with you. Um, but during the, this invitation time, just bring those things before the Lord. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for being the beginning and the end, for being our Savior. Lord, I thank you that your word is convicting, is challenging, but Lord, it also brings hope and joy. And I pray that you would work in the remainder of the service, Lord, and that there is someone who does not know you, Lord, that they would be drawn to you, that even today they would accept you as their Savior. And pray this in Jesus' name.